Abby, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honor to meet you and to have you as a guest here. Uh, let's start with who you are, how you came to found Primetime Partners, and how you got to where you are today. Maybe that's a good place to start. It's always a good place to start. Clint, thank you for having me. Um, I wish I had something witty and uh, and novel to say about how I got where I, I am today. But as a 49-year-old woman sitting across from you on, on the video, I can say like most people, it's a long story. Um, but uh, where I am today is I run a venture fund called Primetime Partners. Uh, we are a venture fund that is focused on uh, the topic of aging and longevity. How I got to this place was not that I was born with a fascination with older adults or ageism, uh, but that I actually kind of grew into this through a series of experiences. Um, and the series of experiences includes being the youngest in my generation and very close to my grandparents. Uh, I grew up outside New York City as the youngest of three girls. Uh, my dad was a small business um, owner. And so I kind of grew up with business in and around uh, the, the, the kitchen table, as, as I would say. So when I graduated college, I wanted to be in business. Uh, and so I joined McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm, as kind of a great launching experience to get started in, in, the, in the profession, went and got a business degree at Harvard Business School, and then spent the next 20 years working in a variety of operating roles, always in small businesses, always in growth roles, including running product at a company called OXO, which makes kitchen tools and gadgets, uh, running um, uh, digital at SoulCycle, another great brand, um, starting a business as a co-founder with Ariana Huffington called Thrive Global in the employee wellness space, and a lot of other uh, experiences in between. So it gave me a lot of uh, data points, if you will, um, always kind of in this growth new business role that when I saw an opportunity, a white space around the topic of aging, I knew as an entrepreneur and as a uh, person who likes to build that there was something to build in the space of aging. Um, and that's why I built a venture firm that I launched in 2020 with my partner, Alan Patrickoff. So can I just say you have already had a Hall of Fame career, my word. Like, it's incredible what you've done, um, who you've worked with, and the various companies that you've worked with. I want to ask a, a couple questions on the background, and then we'll get to, like, um, the, the longevity um, stuff. Tell me about McKinsey. It's such a fa any Anytime I have anybody on this show who worked at McKinsey or is at McKinsey, I've got to ask this question, which is, what is it like there, and what did you learn there? Unfortunately, McKinsey has come uh, upon a, a bit of negative PR recently, um, which there's a whole book about it. And I have to say that I think it is one of the most amazing business institutions in the world. Um, and so when I joined McKinsey at age 21, right, so very young, um, that what McKin working at McKinsey is like is it's the best business training. You've got a group of of, of dedicated consultants who've spent their careers uh, learning, connecting the dots, and helping uh, companies m grow, figure out their problems, et cetera. So I think it is actually a wonderful place to, to build a career and to start your career because you learn so much. Specifically what I learned, I learned how to uh, access information, how to analyze it, how to draw conclusions, how to present, how to work in a, in a a bunch of bunch of different industries, a lot of different executive situations. And in fact, I'll pass along one of the best pieces of advice I got very young from my manager at the time, someone named Vic Malhotra, who was literally like, just he ran the New York office. He was amazing. You know, he pulled me into his office after six months of working with me. And he said, you know, listen, I think you're great. I think you're smart, but you've got one thing you got to fight. And I was like, oh gosh, like what, what is this thing? He's looked at me, he goes, you have no poker face. He says, if you think someone's a moron, it's like written across your forehead. So like, you got to figure out your poker face and just think about like what kind of work environment at age 21, 22, are you having a manager who cares enough about you and your career to really give you that kind of interpersonal feedback? And I use that as one of many data points because for me, it was very foundational. Um, and so I had a great experience. I went back to the firm at a later stage um, to co-run the innovation practice and I have the utmost respect for, for, for the people there. Um, and I think it's a challenge, like any business, uh, to, to grow as fast as they've grown. And there have been some, you know, uh, 
I guess, casualties along the way, but I think the fundamental business model is amazing. So how are you at poker now? <laughs> well, uh, still pretty poor uh, at the actual poker part of poker um, because I, I, uh, I, I don't like to lose money. Uh, and as you know, with poker, you, you win and you lose. Um, but in terms of the uh, question of style, one of the interesting things I've learned through my career is that we can, we have an innate style and mine is one of transparency, uh, and, uh, intimacy, but it doesn't mean you can't evolve it and grow from it. So I can still be my authentic self, but have a bit thicker of a, uh, a filter, which is what Vic was telling me. Yeah. 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 I love that. That That's actually really uh, sound. Great advice, actually. Um, you know, more people need to understand like who you're being in a meeting or who you're, you know, how you're kind of coming across actually has an effect, you know, outside of you. It's not just, um, you know, how you personally feel, but when you're in a room, you know, people can feel how you're feeling, which is really interesting. It is. And that's part of the point of like 360 feedback and all of those things that, you know, especially again, as a young person, uh, and, and in today's environment where young people feel even more empowered than I did in 1996, um, to have a real sense of how you're showing up um, and, and to get that feedback. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, the other one I wanted to ask you about in your background is SoulCycle. Now, this thing has taken off and is just an enormous brand. And when you were there, it seems like that's probably when it was even at its peak. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, listen, I was there just before COVID, um, and COVID dramatically changed the in-person fitness industry, um, uh, as well as my business school classmate uh, who found a Peloton that also changed the uh, the boutique fitness business. Um, but you know, SoulCycle is one of the most amazing brands, and to be like just like OXO, to be kind of in and around a brand that is an experiential brand teaches you so much about the connection between the consumer and the product, the consumer and the service. And I think that's always been a sensitivity I've had around what is the consumer journey. And it sounds kind of hokey when it's like on a, you know, when, when companies talk about it, but at the end of the day, especially now as an investor, like that is the core of anything, which is what journey are you taking the consumer on that is delightful, that is supportive, that is all the adjectives you want for that brand to mean has to start with the product. And so when you walk in, if for those of you who are listening who've never been to SoulCycle or any boutique fitness spin class, it's like you walk into a small room and already you should be transformed by the lighting, the music, the energy, the talent. It is meant to be transformative to, frankly, to make sure you know that, you know, that you're not working out, like it's to make you want to stay there. Um, but, but I think I learned a lot about the experience is point one. Point two is talent. I mean, SoulCycle, like Peloton and other fitness classes, it relies upon the talent that is the leader of the group. And I think you can define talent and business in a lot of different ways. SoulCycle, it's, exterior, it's talent that's consumer facing, but there's talent internally as well. And how you help recruit that talent and, and, and involve them in the brand is something, whether it's internal, external, is really important. Um, and then I think the third thing that I learned, which people might be surprised about, is just data. SoulCycle is incredibly data-driven. And in this world of data and AI, I think a lot of executives toss around that word loosely. But you know, you're looking at a daily report of the sales from the day before. I mean, you have to be data driven. You have to be understanding uh, everything that's going on, all of those metrics. And I think sometimes we forget that um, in a lot of businesses that that at the end of the day, performance is based on knowing your numbers. Yeah, uh, that's interesting, too. Um, OK, now what made you decide I want to go into venture capital? I want to be an investor in the specific space that, that you're in. Why do you see that as like such a, you know, there's so much green grass there? So the topic of aging is something that we don't really talk about a lot um, as a society. And just to kind of level set, I mean, we're dealing right now with a huge population shift that it's like climate change, like with the data has always been there, which is to say that by 2060, there'll be more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. We're basically going through a population that used to look like a pyramid with older adults at the top in the narrow part and is now going to be an inverted pyramid. 
and just think about all the implications that has for every area of our economy, from our health care to our financial services and retirement you know, program and wealth and housing and workplace and consumer media, technology, travel, literally every, every industry is impacted. And so for me, I got interested in this um, because my father um, was uh, retired, forcibly retired um, in, uh, in his 60s. And I started to look around and say, well, what happens in this country in our 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s? Um, and it's no longer this kind of like rosy, perfect, like, you know, retire, hold hands on the sunset, you know, the, you know, and, and walk off because it's really expensive to, to and most people can't afford their retirement. So I kind of got interested from my dad's experience and then started, like, basically McKinsey eyes the problem. I like, you know, whiteboarded and thought about what, what are all the products and services and and new things we need in order to accommodate this aging population. And it was only then, Clint, that I said, and actually, I wish, it was actually someone else said it to me. I forget who it was. I really wish I remember. But someone said, well, Abby, instead of starting one business to be a node or a point in this large map you've created, what if you started a venture fund to back dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs? So I guess in some ways, I'm an entrepreneur where the entrepreneurial venture was a venture fund. Um, as opposed to someone who's grown up saying, hey, I want to be an investor. That's the vocation that I have. Um, and so then I set about saying, well, how am I going to be the best venture fund ever? And I'm very lucky that my business partner, Alan Patrickhoff, who's known as the grandfather of venture capital, uh, he founded Apex, a large private equity firm that actually stands for his name, Alan Patrickhoff and Associates. Um, and then Graycroft Partners, another uh, multi-billion dollar venture fund that he, at the same time that I was thinking about these issues, he was thinking about them as well, so that when I told my friend John Patrickoff, one of Alan's sons, hey, I'm going to start a venture fund focused on aging, he was like, no way, that's what my dad wants to do. Uh, and so I guess what I'm saying is the answer to your question is I'm an accidental venture capitalist that is that had a business idea and paired up with a very experienced venture capitalist, and in 2020, we launched Primetime Partners. Is one of the problems of aging that we're aging better than we ever have before? Like, I'm not sure what the situation is with, with, with your dad in his 60s, but it seems like people who are 60 today are now like super active and want to work and want to be engaged. And like, there's even all this talk of like, we're going to be living over 100 consistently soon, right? Like, and so that could be like, your dad's only like, he has like 40, 45, 50 more years, like who knows, right? And so... Is that part of the challenge and what you're trying to figure out there? Um, so there's two challenges. Um, for some people, they are aging better than before. But if we look at over the past 100 years, our lifespan over the past 100 years has increased by 50 years. But our health span, in other words, how long we live in a healthy, independent way, has only increased by 25 years. So we have actually, while we've increased lifespan, we have more years that we're living in poor health. And those more years that we're living in poor health is an incredible drain on the system. Medicare, which is the healthcare system for those over age 65, um, costs a trillion dollars a year. And it's growing at 8.4%. So normally if it was a business that with a trillion dollar revenue growing 8.4% a year, you say that's amazing. Not when it's coming out of the federal budget. Healthcare costs in our country are going to be 50% of every taxpayer dollar by 2060. So this increase in our time span of being sick, which has actually been enhanced by modern medicine and procedures and devices and all the wonderful parts of medical care, what it's doing is creating a huge cost. So part of what we need to do is, of course, figure out how we increase health span to match our lifespan which is a lot more of the preventative side of longevity. And then at the same time, we need more uh, capacity in our care system, in our healthcare system, in our retirement savings, all of these things to accommodate these longer lives that frankly have not been budgeted for. Yeah. And so who are some of the companies that you've invested in or um, even haven't invested in, but, but in, admire who are kind of tackling this problem? So to, to level set, we do seed to series A investing. So very early, 
So yeah. um, some of these. That's where uh, it's fun, right? Isn't it cool? Oh, like when you're meeting them at the early stage, these early oh my gosh, are super Absolutely. Exciting. I mean, we've, we've met 2,000 companies in the past, you know, four years. And why, why would I mean me? We're a team of five. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've met hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs. And I think, I think you'll find this interesting, Clint, the, the one unifying theme, because we invest, we're a horizontal fund. We invest across health tech, fintech, consumer, we do prop tech, any area that uh, disproportionately impacts the audience age, you know, 50 plus, or what we deem as older adults. It's funny, you know, when we started the fund, it was like thinking about seniors, like, you know, those that are 70, 80. And what we realized was that there just weren't enough founders designing for midlife as well as older life. Um, but what I was going to say um, on that note is that the one unifying theme across all the founders we've, we've in, met is that it's personal for them. They either starting a business where they have some point of relevancy. It's a loved one. It's, you know, their mom was a caregiver. They suffered from, uh, you know, a disease when they were younger. Uh, they were on Medicaid and, you know, saw the challenges of our healthcare system. They're all fixers that want to fix some of these big problems. And so that part of, of investing has been amazing, among other things. Um, but you asked the question of, you know, what are some of the things that, that we're seeing? And I think some of the things that we get really excited about are kind of on two levels. One are just like basic infrastructure, like things that just need to happen to accommodate an aging society. So for example, one of our investments is a business called Safe Ride Health. And what Safe Ride does is it takes older adults, it or sorry, it or is the technology, the logistics technology behind Uber Health and, and Lyft Health and a bunch of hospital systems own fleets that take older adults to the doctor to their doctor, to the pharmacy. It's a logistics business. It's tech enabled. And you think about it, you're like, well yeah, of course. Like how would an older person who has some either disability or can't drive anymore or can't doesn't have a, own a car, how are they going to get to the doctor? Like where well, there's basic businesses of blocking and tackling how we handle a, an aging uh, population that can and should be enabled by technology, leapfrogging what exists. And, you know, Safe Ride's now over $100 million in, in, in ARR because they just plug that hole of what we need as the basic fabric of how we live. Um, and that exists as well on in the wealth management space, um, a business we invested in called Penelope, that's a 401k provider for small businesses. Like small businesses, they're getting regulated. They need to provide their employees 401ks, which is wonderful. We need that for retirement savings. Well, who's going to do that? We need a plan that does that. So I get really excited about some of these very scalable, but also, I wouldn't say basic, but necessity businesses that are brought about by this aging population. So that's one area I get excited about. Then the other area, you know, I hate to use the word AI because it's like, you know, it's it's almost like the butt of every joke now, or you could do a drinking game every time someone mentions it. Um, but I think that the pace of scientific and data um, innovation enabled by, by AI, we're just in this proliferation of, 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 of data and information. And one area that's really interesting is diagnostics. And so if you think about preventative care, how are we going to live to be longer? Well, we need to make some fundamental behavior changes. Like how, sorry, how can we increase our health span? Most of it's behavioral. Yes, there's a genetics piece and there's been a lot of studies, but that's a small portion. We all know that most of it's going to be what we eat, what we drink, what we, you know, how we sleep, stress, environment, all of those pieces in addition to the genetics. So how can we actually change that trajectory? We're going to need to have information on ourselves and our body. And so by now, because of the advances in science and microscopes, we've got gut health. We've got down to the molecular level, the genomics. Like there's all the blood testing and hormones and there's all this information we have now or can have about ourselves. And how we, demo how we make that go from kind of the high net worth, I'm sure you've read stories about the guy in California who's spending millions of dollars extending his own life how we take that information into real diagnostics that are actionable, we really like that space. Um, and so I, I know I'm geeking out a little bit, but I think that the, I kind of interplay between foundational, like this is what we need as a society, as well as kind of more cutting edge. This is how we start to change the slope of, of, of our health span. How do you, I'm just fascinated by like, what does what a typical day look like for you? 
mean, honestly, it's not that exciting. <laughs> um, but, you know, a, a, a typical day, I have pretty decent habits. Um, you know, it's interesting starting a business like this at 45, just how much more um, aware you are of that, as well as uh, for about, you know, two to three years, I spent time as a founder with Ariana Huffington. And Ariana, who wrote the book Sleep Revolution, Thrive, we built a business around individual habits and behavior change that can then uh, be, um, that, you know, it, it as an employee and as a, a kind of in the employer setting. So I guess what I'm saying is I have all the knowledge to have good habits of how I spend my day. Whether I do them is, is another question, but I usually, um, I wake up naturally around, five, again, this might be too granular, but I wake up naturally yeah, around I five. Um, I desperately try not to check my phone for a little bit. Um, and then when I do, I check email and text. I do not go on social media till later in the day. I think curbing social media is critical. It is, I'm sorry, it is so bad for you. Um, and so I really do not have that as a habit. I exercise in the morning, um, usually, but I need to be back and around for my kids. I have three teenagers. Um, and so back and around in the morning at 7 a.m., and then I usually on my way to work, try to connect with a friend. Um, I am very busy. And so if I don't have a way to send a text or a quick call to a friend or a family member, I personally feel disconnected. Um, and then my day is usually Zoom calls, meetings, uh, working with my team. We all are here in the New York office, um, which is fantastic. Um, or I'm traveling. I travel probably four days a month, five days a month. Um, so that's kind of what the day looks like, usually done around six or seven and either home with my kids or social plans and do more emails and rinse and repeat. Does that sound similar or different to other folks you talk to? It sounds great. Yeah. It sounds like, I think you have to build habits and various routines as a leader in order to do anything successful, right? Like if it's kind of just fly by the seat of the pants and you don't really do the same routine every day. I've, I've never actually, this is interesting for you because you meet a lot of founders. Have you ever met a founder who's successful who doesn't at least have some sort of routine and habit? No, I haven't. But but then again, some of their habits aren't super healthy. Like, you know, when you meet the founder who's like the tech guy, uh, the tech person who, you know, stays up till 4 a.m. every morning, like, but that's their cadence. That's their rhythm. The same way that I wake up at 5 a.m. Like I've stopped just like, you know, everyone has their time clock. The key thing is the amount of sleep, you know, if you need to get good sleep. Um, but but I think the piece that I will say I have met founders um, is that and maybe it's just because of my own experience and is that, you know, to make sure you keep learning new things and new habits. Um, and so and, and just new ways of thinking about it. Um, because change is really hard, uh, but we kind of all have to keep evolving. And you'll definitely sometimes meet people who don't have that growth mindset. It's kind of wishy-washy to talk about a growth mindset, but when you meet someone who doesn't have one, you know it. Uh, and so I think that's a piece that we're trying to get a lot better at. And we, we won't back founders you know, that don't have a growth mindset. How is artificial intelligence affecting your job, meaning from a VC and investor perspective, and two, also your space that you're investing in? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have not deployed AI in terms of screening deals or um, in that sense. Like I don't, some funds do that, and particularly public equity investors do that. Uh, we have chosen not to do that because of where we are in our category. This space of aging and longevity is quite a new space of investing. There's only a couple of funds focused on it like we are. Um, and so I've always taken the mentality of take the call, take the meeting. Like I don't want to be screened out of things because we're in a learning and a kind of collaboration mode of where we are in our sector. So we haven't deployed AI against the screening. Where we are using AI is because we are one of the first funds to focus on this topic, we believe really strongly that we need a megaphone and we should be out there speaking and writing and connecting people and, and really in the thought leadership role. 
In fact, we're as a small firm, we, you know, we have a PR firm on retainer. It's probably why I'm talking to you. Uh, and, you know, part of that investment, you know, which is pretty atypical for a fund our size is because we don't think enough people are thinking about these issues. And so I think AI from a content generation standpoint, I mean, it makes it just a lot faster for us to have those fact points, data points, examples. And so, you know, from a, from a content generation, it, it has been fantastic. Then in terms of our portfolio, I mean, most of our companies use AI and I'm not belittling its impact, but it's kind of like asking as, as a company to use Excel or, you know, are you using Salesforce for your sales process. Like it, AI is just a layer or not even layer. It's just integrated into the technology stack and how you do things. But the specific examples where it's been working very well for our companies are things like, you know, workflow automation. Um, you know, it, that's an obvious point. The diagnostic piece I already spoke to, you know, we have a company called Isaac Health in the dementia care space, and they're able to take data from health plans and basically use AI to find the, basically based on the criteria to, to identify which health plan members should be getting a dementia diagnostic because of their past health history. And so there can be interventions or diagnostics based on AI. So that's an interesting space um, as, as well. And then an, uh, another area that we really like is um, in care planning. So one of the challenges um, for a uh, older adult um, is that, you know, they're on, you know, an average of 10 medications. They have a lot of specific needs they need to do during the day. How can you use AI to take all the different things they should be doing during the day and put it into a calendar and a schedule and prompts and this and that? So there's kind of a data assimilation role um, that AI can play um, it, as well. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it across the board. I will kind of share that um, we have a bit of a joke right now because there's just been so many AI startups. And the reason why there are AI startups is it's a wonderful technology. It's available to everyone. So if you're a, if you're a, found, a founder or an entrepreneur saying, I want to build a business, it's, it's like an API, like you can just build faster. And so the number of businesses we're seeing, so we kind of have an internal joke of like, whether we're going to try to discount, because you know, the people who come in and they talk about the AI and their products, they expect a valuation increase. We are like, you know, trying to figure out how we uh, ding them for using AI the other way. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Everybody's an AI startup now. You have to be. You've yeah. got to have AI somewhere in your pitch, it seems like. Yeah. Otherwise, um, you know, that it really is kind of table stakes, probably like an API or cloud in the past or internet even, right? Like it's kind of just table stakes at this just point. Just table you gotta, stakes. you got to have some sort of. Hey, what did you learn from um, Ariana Huffington and helping uh, and running Thrive Global with her? She's amazing. Like she's like, what an amazing, you know, founder, leader, author, woman, um, mother, you know, she's just, she's fantastic. Um, I think I learned a few things. Um, one is <coughs> she, and maybe it's a Ray Dalio thing as well, that she was believer, you know, it's this kind of radical transparency. Um, and I think it's interesting having started my career at McKinsey, where as a consultant, you want to make sure you have the data and the right way of saying things and, you know, uh, making your pitch in your case. I think Ariana is very much um, about uh, being direct um, in a way that was very helpful for me um, to see that modeled. Uh, I think the second thing is just generosity. Um, you know, she has built a career and, and, and I think I'm naturally oriented that way, but this sense of be generous with your connections, be generous with your insights, with your time. Um, and I think that generosity, particularly because most businesses are about relationships. Um, and I think that that is, uh, that is really critical. Uh, and then I think the last piece, um, I mean, I've learned so much from her, but you know, she's as a author and as a media personality, she, when we started thrive, she had very clear language on what the business was. And you would be rare to find her not using that same language. Those like four sentences again and again, to build awareness and to hammer in the point. And I think that's, you know, as a marketer, that's really important. And so at, at primetime, we've just really stuck to the script in a way of what we're trying to get the world to understand about why they need to be prepared for and invest in and care about an aging population. So I think that thought leadership piece, I, I literally just learned so much from her about. What do you read? 
what reading recommendations would you have for us? You know, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I, so I, I was thinking about, you know, how do I sound really smart, but I'm going to be really <laughs> realistic, which is I'm a full-time working mom with three kids. I run my own business. Like I, I read books on vacation when I go on vacation. And when I'm on vacation, I will go to my friend Zibby Owens who runs Read with Zibby and find something light to read. Um, but what I do every day is um, I ask Alexa for the news. She's my best friend. Uh, we talk in the morning when I'm in the, sh in the shower and out of the shower. I subscribe to a lot of newsletters, usually at the fringe of what I do for work. So, you know, business newsletters um, or newsletters of other venture investors that are adjacent to what I do. And then my secret little hack is, you know, if you follow any, as I said, venture funds, nonprofits, anything kind of in and around my space, they'll usually have in their newsletter what we're reading. And so I like to read the, the primary reports, like if it's a report by the Kaiser Foundation on family caregiving or by the West Health or CMS or government reports, I kind of like to read the primary source data. So it's a long-winded way of saying I read a lot of work stuff, but I try for the work information to either be new data and insights or other people's opinions that are adjacent or a little bit further away from me. Um, the last thing I, I would say that I, I do read, I don't know if it's reading is the right way because right now it's about watching, is I don't go on social media a lot, but what is on my social media channel are comedians. And laughter is so important. And so if I need to like, if I have a little bit of downtime, it's like comedy, like all the way. I love that answer. I'm the, I'm actually the exact same way on that last point. Who are some of your uh, com favorite comedians? I mean, right now, uh, I'm going to get his name wrong, like Nate Bargatze. Yeah, um, yeah who, he's great. He's great. And then there's like, again, because Instagram is scary and it knows me, I'm putting it in air quotes. Um, but there's basically a lot of female like mom comedians who, you know, just it's like the Tina Fey and that whole uh group, um, Ali, um, I forgot her last name. Um, but, uh, where there's just kind of this like reality of like, you know, how hard it is to be a, a woman in the workplace, how hard it is to be a mom. And it's just relatable humor. Yeah. What are you, what is your thoughts on DEI and kind of the, um, overall, I, I don't know. I don't know the best way to say it. it's become like a controversial topic. Like it's being attacked maybe is the best way to say that. What do you think about that? How do you think about it? And how do you do it? advise your um, kind of early stage founders and companies to think about it? It's a great question. And it's a very sensitive one, I think that, but needs to be kind of discussed from a, from a leadership perspective, just to level set, like all of the data, which I believe is that a diverse workforce, a diverse experience is the right business decision. Um, I also believe it's the right societal decision. So I'm in favor. I mean, I think it'd be really hard if someone came on the show and said they're not in favor of diversity and inclusion. So, uh, so it's a it's a it's, it's an obvious point. But I am uh, I am a proponent of, of of diversity and inclusion. The issue when you say DEI though is that it has become institutionalized in a way that I think has become um, so defensive that we've forgotten the point of it, which is actually for people to feel included. And that means everybody feels included. And now we basically ended up with a DEI where it's really diversity and exclusion, not diversity and inclusion. And so I think that's where we need to get back to basics around what inclusion means. And I can even take the, uh, the population that we care most about, which are older adults. Like they're not part of DEI. Like they're not included in anything. Um, and so there's a lot of populations that are excluded from DEI. So what do I think about it? I think it, if we can get back to the intent um, and, and deliver on it in ways that are tr not exclusionary, um, that would be wonderful. In terms of how we're working on it, I mean, we have a super diverse team of our investments. You know, half the women are founders, 40% uh, are people of color. You know, so, you know, we are we are in a space and in a headspace where we're 
it's, it's important to what we do. Um, and, you know, I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, like any thing, it comes down to personal, to individual actions and choices. And that's the other thing that kind of bums me out about DEI is it kind of feels like it was like, oh, that's someone else's responsibility. That's somebody else's, you know, someone else will handle this for me. No, it's like, you know, we ageism, which is one of the things we're really worried about. Like it has to be an, every person needs to be aware of their bias and, 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 and manage it accordingly. That's the best answer I've heard to that question. Well done. That was great. What about ESG? Like, and obviously this is kind of more for public companies and private equity groups and things like that. Do you think about that? I mean, it's along the same line, so maybe it's redundant to, to ask it, but how, how do you think about that particular issue? It's interesting because I'm literally reviewing proposals right now to bring in an advisor to help us put in place our ESG practices um, for our portfolio companies and ourselves. Um, most of the time, it's really viewed around climate and environment, which is less relevant for most of our businesses that are tech businesses. And so for us, it's a lot more around aging and older adults is our lens on ESG. Um, what do I think about it? I think that it's not going to happen without regulatory pressure. I think if you think about any change that's happened in, in our economy and our business environment is happened because the government has said you have to do it. Uh, it's not out of the, you know, there are B Corps and there are companies that like to do it because they think it's the right thing to do. But the way a capitalist economy works is because you have no choice but to do it because ESG is expensive. So until there's a lot more regulatory support and, and focus on it. And if you just think about, you know, anything around climate, it's, it's happened because of the regulatory environment not because of good citizens wanting to do the right thing. So what do I think? I think it's, I think it's, again, I think it's the right thing to do at, from, a, uh, from where our society needs to go, but it's not going to happen without more uh, regulatory. Uh, again, I'm sure you can tell my political beliefs just based on the sentence alone. <laughs> No, that's incredible. I won't go deeper on your political, we're not a political show, but yeah, that's incredible. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, what are your thoughts? Now I'm going to ask you probably a blatantly political question. Um, we've got this current macroeconomic environment. We've got inflation where it is. You've got kind of the consumer feeling pinched. They go to the grocery store. Prices are super high. Uh, add to that kind of the, just the civil unrest or maybe political unrest, given that we're in an election year. How, what are your thoughts on kind of like where we're at right now as a society, as a culture? I mean, the United States is not the only country that's about to have a bunch of a, have an election. There's a bunch of countries that are about to do this. Where do you think we're at right now? And how do you um, advise your companies and your founders on that? So I'm an optimist. Um, I'm glass half full. Um, it's great. One of my colleagues on the team, he's glass half empty. So we actually together make a really great investor. Um, but, uh, so where do I, where do I see things? I st still believe, believe in individuals and people's desires to be, to succeed, to be happy, to protect their, themselves, their, their loved ones. And so I think that that ultimately is the undercurrent whenever there is distress or political change or economic uncertainty that I do believe individuals will make act, will take action to move themselves forward because we all are self-interested and that self-interest collectively will make sure we're okay. That's a very nebulous answer, but I think that's kind of how I'm wired. Having said that, uh, what we do tell our founders is that there is so much uncertainty that you cannot rely on one customer, one way of doing things, one you need option value. And part of that option value is getting to profitability faster. So coming out of the investment cycle, you know, if, if 2020, 2021 were these crazy valuations and people raising a lot of money, you saw in 23, it was particularly companies uh, really pulling back, cutting their workforce, um, to making steps so they could stretch their 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 funding longer. Um, and so I think we continue to talk to our founders around um, pushing towards profitability sooner than you normally would from like the dot com boom where every you know no one was profitable ever, um, as well as having a lot more overlapping, redundant uh, products, redundant sales channels, um, and really reducing that probability of success 
because as great as your product or service is, if your customer, particularly your enterprise customer, your consumer is feeling nervous or skittish, it's just you can't rely on that. So I think we're, we're, we're talking to our founders about being more conservative, even though I know, and this is a great thing about being with my partner, Alan, he's been an investor for 50 years. He's seen every cycle. Everything works in a cycle. I mean, you have to look, be his, it's not, you don't have to be a historian to look back and say there's a cycle to everything. And so you just got to get to the other side of the cycle. Finally, we end every interview with the same question, and that is at CEO.com. We believe the chances one gives is just as important as the chances one takes. I wonder when you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? So I was uh, 18, no, I was 20. I was interviewing at McKinsey, and I uh, showed up for my interview in New York City office, and I started, they do something called a case study where they ask you a case question on business. And Zubin Tarabavala, who uh, recently retired, he was asking me the question, and about six minutes in, I knew I was messing it up. Like, I was flailing, and I was circling, and my math wasn't adding up, and I was flustered. I mean, I was young, but I was flustered. And he looked at me, and he said, all right, we're going to forget the past 10 minutes happened, which to me felt like three hours of pain and sweating. Uh, he's like, and we're going to start again. And I know it's a really small thing, but that sense of, first of all, the empathy he had, plus the second chance you get. And I wouldn't say that like that was the rest of my career and everything was said and there have been setbacks since then. But that for me, if he hadn't given me another chance, I'm not, I, I think it just was so foundational. Um, and there's been a lot of times where I've gotten a lot of chances, both personally and professionally, but I think being able to recognize that you make a mistake, you pick yourself up and you keep going. Um, that's something that is a founder needs to have and to know. And thank you, Zubin, for like picking me back up and letting me start again. Abby, thank you so much for coming on. Seriously, what, what an honor. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed with what you're doing. You've had an incredible career and it seems like you're just getting started uh, with Primetime Partners. Uh, we'll continue to follow you and best of luck with everything. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Clint.